right, welcome to Culture Starts With You. This is a podcast all about culture and core values. We feature guests that are in a leadership role that also care deeply about culture and core values. Today, we have a great guest. Mark Scantlin is with Kemen Industries. He's also in YPO and someone I've known for several years now. I'm excited to have him on today and share his background and also his views on culture and core values. So welcome, Mark Scantlin. Uh, it's great to have you and appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. In his current role, Scanlon oversees all shelf life, flavor, color, and food safety solutions for the North America and Latin America food markets. Scanlon began his career at Kemen as Worldwide Director of Human Resources. He developed career ladders to provide all employees, ranging from entry level to executive, with a clear and objective path for future growth. Scanlon also des- designed and initiated an international selection system that reduced involuntary turnover. Planning to rejoining Kemen in his current role in 2015, Scantlin was president of Eurofins Microbiology Laboratories, Inc. Before that, as a United States Air Force captain, Scantlin served as section commander of the 30th Security Forces Squadron at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California and the 7th Airborne Command Control Squadron at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. He received his bachelor's degree from Kansas State University and his master's degree in managerial economics from the University of Oklahoma. Welcome, Mark Scanlon. All right, Mark, so we like to start things off here with a fun song. So I like to ask the question, when you wake up in the morning, and right now a lot of us are walking to our desks, we're either working remote, or if you do drive with a commute and then you have your walk to the office, to your desk, what would be that walk-up song or entrance song playing in your head every morning? I would say probably the song, Mark, that I use that maybe not every morning, but you know when you have those very important meetings or customer meetings, um, probably M&M's Lose Yourself. That that just kind of has that that beat that gets gets everything going, and uh, it kind of just addresses what happens when things go wrong, because chances are things are going to go wrong when you go into those meetings. Right. I've actually heard that one before, so that's that's a great one. Yep. Um, and then there's probably right. Sia Never Give Up. You know, I like that one too. Um, there's probably a couple of more that I probably can't say on the podcast, but yeah, there's, there's some good ones. <laughs> All right. Okay, so again, this is all about culture and core values. So kind of with that lens on it, you know, uh, social responsibility seems to be a big focus at Kemen. So how does that impact your your company culture? You know, um, from the very, I guess, beginning stages when I started at Kemen, the the culture was really reflected in the vision statement itself. Um, When when I started, it was, we strive to improve the quality of life by touching half the world's population with our products and services. We we achieved that a few years ago. Um, We've now switched that vision to where we're now wanting to transform the quality of life by touching 80% of the world's population. And we're really wanting to do that by the year 2042, which is is a ways out. Um, If I kind of look at the world's population, that's... I don't know, close to nine billion, little over, something like that. But to your to your point of of how that is defined in the culture, that's really the foundation of why we all get up in the morning at, at Kemen, why I get up at, at Kemen. And it really looks at okay, just the words. If we're looking at transform, we're wanting to do this in a sustainable fashion. Um, transform, we've we've had a quantitative definition applied to that, where we're looking at really five times that we influence a person's life. Whether it's food that they, you know, uh, bacon and eggs in the morning, a sandwich at lunch, um, the, the pet food that, uh, that we provide um, antioxidant solutions for, um, to the genes that people wear. Um, we're wanting to make sure that we do have a clear definition of what we are doing to really improve uh, the quality of life around the world. So I think if you look at it, it's really at the foundation within that vision of Kimmen. And when we recruit people, we're recruiting people to really reflect uh, what they can do uh, specifically in that vision. Awesome. And so I know from your, your background, uh, Kimmen actually requires a few things. Like to be in the role that you are in, you can't just be nobody. I mean, you've got to have some bio, bi- biology background. There's some specific uh, requirements they have. Maybe dig into that because I think that's, that's an interesting part of the culture as well. That is, is, yeah, you may meet the leadership qualities, but you also have to, these technical qualities that we're going to require given what we do. Well, it's, it's a good question from the standpoint that, yes, uh, we have 
an abundance of PhDs, whether it be in organic chemistry, microbiology, um, biochemistry. It, I, I think we count, I lose count, maybe a hundred of those PhDs within Chemin. And that's very important for providing those solutions that we're after. At the same time, we want people that really fit into the, the core values and the culture that we have within Kimmin. Um, for me personally, I don't have a, a formal chemistry or microbiology degree. That said, I've learned the science, and it's important that you can learn that science. But Kimmin takes risks. They take risks more on people that are highly energetic. Um, they want to make a difference. Uh, they come to work uh, really wanting to do the very best that they can. Uh, that's, I think, more important than having um, a technical degree or background. Again, it's important for us to have those in order to provide these solutions. At the same time, it's a blend and a balance of technical and non-technical, but more importantly, it's passionate energy and leadership that we have within the company. So speaking to the risk aspect, uh, earlier in 2021, uh, Kemen acquired a food technology company called Proteus Industries. So how are you working? You know, and I know that Kemen has a, a rich history of lots of acquisitions and, and uh, expansion. So how do you work on getting that, you know, unified culture and core values? Do they live in their own in some of these divisions? Or is it something that you're trying to work on, you know, overall to have a consistent, uh, you know, culture across the board? Yeah, you're right. Um, and I think people that are going to be listening to this know that, no matter how great the target company is from a financial standpoint, uh, synergies are not going to occur unless you have a good cultural fit with the company. Again, that, that's the biggest failure that we see in acquisitions. The fortunate thing with the company that you're referring to, uh, Proteus, uh, we did acquire them um, April of this year, of 2021. That said, we had the opportunity to work with all of the employees of Proteus for about a year before that. We had, we had over a year of due diligence uh, before we actually signed the papers to, uh, to, to acquire the company. In that, we were able to see firsthand how those employees uh, would be able to fit into the Kemen culture. And we were assessing that just as much as we were assessing the technology as to are they going to be a good fit uh, to come into to Kemen. And throughout that, it's easy to see when things are going well, um, how people react. Maybe not so great as we had, we had a lot of failures along the way when we were trying to get the technology to do what we wanted it to do. We had failures and that was where I really looked at how are they reacting to this? Do they lose their head and start blaming it on other people? Um, or do they own it? And they look at it as it's a stumbling block. Now, what are we going to do to move, head, move ahead? It's the ones that kind of get into a funk and a, and, a, and a down state that those really kind of get me wondering, is it a good fit to come into this company? Because this company is a research-based company. And just by the definition there, we are going to have many failures. It's more of how then do we learn from those failures and move forward to really get these solutions that we're after. And that's what Kimmon was based and, and founded upon. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you, you kind of touched on this earlier too, but a couple of years ago, Kemen announced a, a big new philosophy and vision and goals around sustainability. Uh, do you feel as, like this impacts your team members? Does it make people proud and excited to work for your organization and, and, and have an impact uh, on morale and workplace environment? And again, you kind of touched on this, but I think it's uh, maybe a broader topic as well. Yeah, we, we did. Um, and I would say that was one of the better decisions that we made as a leadership team is as we moved into how are we going to define sustainability within Kemen, we did not do that in a vacuum. We actually brought the teams together, um, diagonal slice within, within all of the, the company, both from a, a regional standpoint as well as from a position standpoint, and came up with how are we going to look at that very popular term now, sustainability. And when we did it, we made some significant changes at Kemen. We looked at it from the view or the lenses of the business, uh, the employees, as well as the planet, and said, okay, how is Kemen going to be a part of those three lenses? Um, otherwise, you're just all over the place with sustainability. So we really had to zero into, into those three areas. And when we looked at it um, from the, the people standpoint, it was really uh, reaffirming what we had been doing uh, all along with, with the people, and that is making sure we afford time, situations, 
um, opportunities for those employees to be able to give, at, give back to, uh, to the community however they would like to, as well as programs of which Kemen are clearly uh, involved with. For example, the uh, World Food Program, Kemen has been involved with for many, many years. And it's something that is very near, to, near and dear to our heart from the standpoint that we can absolutely see where the solutions that we do, uh, particularly with, it's, it's actually, it's a date bar. We make date bars. Uh, we have a scientist that's dedicated to really make sure we can keep that product going um, in war-torn areas. So if you look at where, where the World Food Program gets involved, um, it's whenever there is unrest around the world, they're the first ones in there to make sure that they can get nutrition into those that are in need, refugees, for example. And so uh, we can see that. We can see that the products that we are helping create are going into those, and employees can get involved with that, as well as a host of number of different programs, both from a regional as well as from a worldwide standpoint. When we look at the business, um, we're really looking at ways of which we can partner and team up with our customers, uh, at the end of the day, we have to be profitable. And so we want to create solutions that are not just profitable for Kemen, but are obviously mutually profitable for our, our customers as well. And so we have to make sure we have a healthy business from a bottom line standpoint in order for us to be sustainable. If we look at uh, the planet, we look at ways of which we can improve and minimize the footprint that Kemen has, whether it be from solar technology, um, Kemen just completed a solar technology program here in Des Moines, of which the headquarters, which I'm setting in right now, is 100% powered by solar panels. That's one area. Then to the way of which we source our products and raw materials. Um, the rosemary that we use, which we extract carnosic acid from that to be able to use for antioxidants, we are vertically integrated and in a sustainable um, growing of rosemary. We have I don't know, around 1,200 acres in, in Texas and New Mexico. And that rosemary is not something that is just decimated and then we leave the land and go to something else. We are able to continue to harvest that rosemary, which is something that had never been done uh, before Kim and started that program. And there's a bunch uh -huh. of different examples that we use with that as well. I, I want to go back to the, the date bars in, in war-torn areas. So a lot of, you know, newer people coming into the workforce young, right out of college, they care deeply about making an impact on the world. And, and I actually think that that's becoming more broadly. I think we all do on some level. And so that's pretty powerful that you're doing something to help war torn countries, especially food and nutrition. So do you feel energy behind that? When those topics are discussed, can you feel a change in the way that people react and, and the passion they pour into that project versus maybe not that others aren't as important, but that's got a pretty big meaning behind it. It does, and and you know I think that the simple answer is yes. Um, more so for some people. For other people, it may be they want to reduce the amount of water usage that is going on. That that encourages them more. And so, you know, when we look at those, we look at we're in uh, in textiles and in, in the jeans that probably everybody on this call is wearing. Um, you know, we want to find ways of which we don't use as much water as it used to take to be able to get the whitewashing of those jeans because they were using stones. If you ever heard of stone washed, that's what was being done. Um, we found a way to do it with enzymes, which the enzymes we were using uh, for, we didn't start with textiles. We used them in, in completely different industries, for example, in tortillas. Uh, we can use those enzymes, though, to introduce into the textiles to where you don't have to go through all of that water usage and the wasting of the water and the impact that that has on the environment. So for some people, that's why they get up in the morning. So it's, in other words, we're not trying to be all things to all people. It's instead trying to find those people that at least have a passion for something that we're standing for. And that really gets them up in the morning. Absolutely. That's, that's awesome. Okay, so Kemen, it, it's a family business, and, and I've always been impressed with, they're not just in first generation, so you mentioned Chris earlier, he's third or fourth generation, if I remember correctly? He's second generation. Second generation, but they've, they've planned out to how far? Currently, we have another five generations uh, that they're set up um, to be able to continue to, to pass that along, uh, the companies uh, to, to pass that along, and I think 
you know, it's important to say R.W. and Mary, they are the founders of, of Kimmon. And now we have the second generation, which is both Chris as well as uh, Libby Nelson, who is his sister. Both of them are, are representing the, the second generation for Kimmon. And we already have um, third generation um, empl- uh, uh, kids that are in, involved in the company um, at all levels within, within Kimmon. And there's regular times that we have other members of the family that are brought into Kimmon that we start really trying to involve them at a very early age as to what Kimmon is doing. Again, seeing if they have that same passion to want to to join the company. It's not easy for the family members to come to Kimmon. Um, They have to have at least worked in a different company for, I think, a period of two to three years. They have to show that they were promoted in that environment. So it wasn't something that they just went in and did their time and then come to Kimmon. There, it, it's not easy for the family members to come into to Kimmon. It's not, it's not something they're just given. Right. Which I would imagine would impact the, the culture because you respect that person much more than just, oh, they were handed this job. I would have to imagine that impacts the culture on some level. Very much. Yeah, they have, yeah. To, they have to show them that they uh, are able to, to perform outside of Kimmon. Excellent. All right. So... How do you, you're not part of the family, you've, you've come in as an outsider, so to speak, right? So how do you put your own mark on a family business? You're the president of a division, a large one, it's big business within multiple business units. So how do you put your own mark on that, but still keep that family value, family, you know, cultural alignment and, and whatnot? You know, it'd be easy to say um, we are part of the family. Uh, you know, we're, we're all, we all act and, and cooperate the same. And that, that's not the case. Um, what I've been impressed with from the family standpoint is the amount of autonomy and decision-making non-bureaucracy that's awarded to the business unit presidents. So while we have our foundation of our our core values as well as our vision, um, it's up to us to be able to build our own businesses that we have that uh, based on that are still reflective of what the what the family stands for. So again, very broad definition of what the family um, has, has developed here, and it does allow the business unit presidents to, to bring in their own approach to uh, culture and, and taking their interpretation of the values and bringing it into the business units. All right, so I know this, and I think this is a really great uh, part of your past, but you're in the Air Force, uh, you're a commander, uh, so what did you learn in the Air Force in regards to or- organizational culture and core values? And, and have you applied those in the private sector? Have there been versions or variations of it? Like, There's got to be an interesting twist there for, for you with that background. Sure. Um, that's, a good, that's a good point. So uh, when, I, when I started, I was right out of uh, college. I did ROTC and then, and then went into the Air Force, as you said there. Um, at that point, the Air Force was still a little bit of a command and control type environment. Um, that said, uh, I was a second lieutenant, um, promoted up to a first lieutenant and then to a captain. Um, the, the one thing I, I really took from that experience was I knew nothing. As a second lieutenant, you know nothing going into the Air Force, but yet you're awarded all of this authority as a second lieutenant of you're, you're the responsible one there. And the good thing that I, that I took away from that is the importance of the non-commissioned officers, the NCOs there. And I was fortunate to have two very important and influential ones with me. The ones that were respectful in the, in the exterior in front of um, the other uh, the Air Force personnel, but they're also the ones that would come in and shut the door and say, all right, Lieutenant, you messed this up bad. Don't ever do this again. Um, those, those were the experiences that I really recognized that you better understand and listen to the people that you work with. And even though that you're in charge of it, there are situations that you know nothing about and you really need to surround yourself with people that know a lot more than you. And I know that that phrase is overused, but it's so true. And that is something that I think I did take, uh, from the Air Force. Um, there was one time we had to, uh, deliver, I was a section commander and we had to deliver disciplinary action. And my non-commissioned officer always said, don't do this unless I'm here with you to do it. Well, I didn't listen. And so the, uh, the troop came in and I forgot to disarm him. And he, uh, he had an M16 and the staff sergeant that was next to him 
uh, also forgot to disarm him. So I proceeded to go through the disciplinary action with this, uh, this airman, and a click happened. Now, no one really knows what the click was. Um, some people argued that it was the safety that was coming off. At that same time was when my NCO walked in, disarmed that airman very quickly, and proceeded to dismiss everybody in the room, shut that door, and laid into me like nothing else. And it was the best experience in the world. I hated it when it was happening. I was embarrassed, scared, because I didn't know what was really going on with it. Um, but he knew that he needed to be there to make sure all of the steps were taken to ensure we could go through this disciplinary action. So that was, uh, that was a very tangible example of you better listen to those people around. They can literally save your life. Wow. That's a, that's a pretty good leadership. Real, 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 very real leadership. Uh, Exercise. <laughs> Wish everybody could yeah. go through it. Yeah. Uh, maybe not. I don't know if I needed to go through it. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so... Let's, let's back up a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get to the seat you're in today? You've got a, a beautifully colored past with the Air Force and, and a couple different organizations. So maybe just walk through that a little bit. Well, um, at about six years in the Air Force, um, we, uh, my family, Melinda, and uh, we had two, two kids at the time. We were kind of debating what pathway we wanted to take. Did we want to stay and go career Air Force or was it time to get into the public sector? And we were home in southwest Kansas doing wheat harvest. Um, it's actually my wife's farm, and I was allowed at that time to uh, be on the combine, never drive the combine, wasn't allowed to do that. She has three sisters, and they were the ones that operated the combine. So I could be on the combine. But I got a call at that point from a friend that was a navigator, and he had moved to Des Moines. And he said that there was a human resources position opened up at this company called Kimmon Industries. Of course, I didn't know who Kimmon was, never been to Des Moines. Uh, but he said, is there any way that you can get on a plane tomorrow to come do an interview? Mind you, this was a Saturday night at Liberal, Kansas. And I said, well, what do I need to wear? Because I had a you know, white T-shirt on, dirty with dirt and mud and all over. And he said, oh, just make sure you have a, a button-down shirt and a tie. There was no button-down shirt or a tie that I could get. So small town liberal, we found the owner of J.C. Penney's. We were able to open it up so I could get on the plane on Sunday and came in and did the interview, which, by the way, again, I knew nothing about HR. Um, I started uh, trying to figure out what at least some of the basic terms were of ADA, um, you know, whatever the, the different HR terms were at the, at the time, FMLA. <laughs> and those were actually questions that were asked during the interview when I started. So I at least acted like I knew what I was doing with it. But um, what I noticed at that point is that Kimmon was interviewing for passion. They were interviewing for uh, energetic people that were going to come in. And so that team that I interviewed with, uh, great team, um, didn't know if I'd gotten the job or not, left, got the call and said, okay, we want you to, to move to Des Moines. Uh, talked to my wife and she said, okay, I guess we're moving to Des Moines. Again, never been there. But we transitioned out of the Air Force, uh, went to Kimmon and started their whole HR program. Um, from there, I stayed for about six years, started, went to Worldwide HR, and then I went to a company called Eurofins Scientific and started their microbiology. And this was the time of which I did start to learn the technical side. Um, Mike Russell was my boss at that one, so we go back to the mentors with and he, uh, he said, okay, go ahead and try to start this microbiology. And your first lesson is, can you, stay, can you say a Listeria monocytogenes? And I could not say it at the time. And he said, okay, first lesson is you've got to figure out how to use these terminologies in microbiology. And I said, Mike, I, I have no idea what I'm doing in this. And I remember he walked out and hit my shoulder and he said, do what you do best. And he walked in and I thought, okay, that's just a phrase. What does he mean by it? And he, he really was meaning something, which is, all right, you were in human resources. The number one thing that you did and what you did very well with was to go in and, and recruit people. And so at that point, there were no sales in microbiology. I went out and recruited the entire team, very high quality microbiologists, um, business development people that could work with me. And we grew that into uh, a company that was turning over around 15 million in sales, and we expanded it to five locations. Um, at that point, uh, talked to Kim and again, and Chris and Giuseppe Abrate, my boss now, and they said it's time to come home. And so I came back and started uh, leading the food technologies division um, here at Kimmon. 
and that's been the story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. So w- w- something at Spinny Tech that we focus a lot on, you've probably heard this in conversations with me, but is, you know, the get better every day mentality, that constant continual improvement. So what do you do for yourself to continue to learn and, and encourage and able? And I, I always think it starts with the leader. When you showcase that, it's going to have your team follow. But what do you do personally to get better every day? You know, I'll talk a little bit about what I do personally in a little bit, but what I try to instill upon my whole leadership team is our job um, at the end of the day is to grow our people. And it's not always fun when, when we do that. And it's not fun for, for my direct reports either. They know that. And I always kind of look at the phrase, if you're, if you're comfortable, you're, you're doing something wrong. My job is not to make you comfortable. My job is to continually challenge you. And if you're uncomfortable, you're doing the right thing. That means I'm continuously putting situations in front of you that uh, is going to allow you to grow. And that's my expectation for my leadership team for, for their employees. And I think that comes from then Chris and, and Giuseppe to me as well. Um, it's that constant push to say, what is the next idea? We just had our strategic plan meeting with all of the Kemen Industries uh, leadership team last week and we have all of these great initiatives going on from as you mentioned mark the proteus acquisition we have some natural acids that we're bringing into our market a lot of good ideas that are going on and i thought we're all set and it was two minutes after we had the conversation giuseppe said what's next what what are you doing next and i it it took me aback i said what do you mean what are we doing next we have all of these ideas that we're doing that's great that's great what are we doing next so you know, I think it's more of what they're doing with me and then what I in turn do for, uh, for my direct reports that's a good environment for continuous progress, continuous change, um, and, and never relaxing. Yeah, good, good. All right, uh, maybe describe, I, so I know the, the, the campus at Kemen in Des Moines is, is pretty amazing. You've got a, a great building, you've got a dining center, you've got workout facilities. How do those things, has the value of that changed in the last two years? Has it increased? Like, just talk about the physicality of culture and, and you know, what's all going on in the world right now. And, and are you set up for success? Do you need to adapt? There's a lot of things in that question, but kind of unpack that for what that means to Kemen. So, you know, back to, I think, the first thing that you were saying with it, which was, what does the campus mean? And, and there was a, a transition that took place when we brought all of the business units to this central campus. Because before that, we had outgrown the original campus, and that's what really started the construction of this. What that did was it brought all of the business <coughs> units from our food divisions to our pet divisions to our ag divisions, um, as well as the KI group, Kemen Industries group, under one roof. And while the workday allowed for quick you know, uh, check-ins uh, between business units, it also introduced lunchtime where we have as you mentioned the uh, the cafeteria which we are very proud of it's called r dubs after the the founder rw um you know i kind of feel sorry for uh, burger king and mcdonald's that are just about three blocks away because as soon as we open this up i mean i know the business just dropped considerably for them it's because people stay here uh, it's really good food we got some good healthy food but it really ar- allowed some interaction outside of you know business discussions to take place uh, and so that was a good cultural integration that we were able to do. Um, Starbucks, obviously, is a good one for the morning uh, and afternoons, I guess, for some people uh, to be able to meet there and kind of catch up. The fitness facility um, is one that we continually encourage. It, it's great to uh, all times of the day just to take 30 minutes and go in there and, and you know run a little bit or lift little weights. It's probably the area I get most in trouble with because it's supposed to be a work-free zone and I can't help it. If I'm in there and three other people come in and you know we have some work to conversations, I'll start on the conversation, but I'm continually counseled that is not the right environment for that. And so I'm working on it, but I'm, I have to admit it, it's not always the case. Fast forwarding now, we have the pandemic that hit. And with that, we did shut down, um, not all of it, but a vast majority of the workflow and the uh, employees coming in. And so that's introduced a different kind of environment for us now where we're trying to balance what we had with this, you know, uh, culture that we have established with what 
the working from home kind of introduced into the workforce. And so that's one where, again, we're having to listen to the employees and listen to the managers as to how are we going to adapt? How are we going to morph with this? So we have introduced a policy that does allow for some work from home. Um, I'm going to kind of wait and see how that plays out. Uh, for me personally, I really enjoy having everybody here that we can interact. That said, I know the world has changed a little bit. And I know that there, the word flexibility has really become a, a common terminology when it comes to uh, work-life balance and location of where work is being done. So I, I can't answer as to what's right and wrong on that. I can say that you know, we have had to be more flexible in how we're approaching it. Yeah, I think we're all still learning and, and flexibility means different things to different people and, and work environment means different things to different people. And so I think we're all still learning and it, that's why it's such a, an interesting topic right now because uh, it does continue to change and evolve and what we believe today may change six months from now and uh, 12 months from now. So, so it's a, a good evolving one. All right. Uh, looking back, uh, what like your philosophy on culture and core values go back to just, and let's say post Air Force, uh, when your service was done, what what's changed, you know, on the way you view culture and core values versus today? You know, I think um, I don't say much has changed as much as it has been uh, maybe more uh, more adapted to to what the environment is. Um, yeah, I. I Again, the hierarchy of the Air Force, whenever I was in there, was very rank-focused. Um, I have to say that the way I was um, brought up in the Air Force, when I go back to those non-commissioned officers, was much, much more advanced in the understanding of, of how we interact than maybe a lot of people had, had been brought up in the Air Force. And so with that, I was very grateful that... Um, you know, that I had been subjected more towards, okay, even though you're the officer in the environment, um, you need to really pay attention to what's going on. And that was really the environment of security forces, where there were very few officers, and it was very heavily driven by um, enlisted or non-commissioned officers. So I was very subject to that. Um, that said, you know, uh, Tammy Goldenfinning was my boss uh, when I when I joined here. She will continually say that uh, she had to culture me a lot into what the environment of Kemen was compared to the environment of Air Force. <clears throat> and I know that there were some learning pains. There was learning pains on both sides. Um, from the intensity level of, you know, how we interact, um, that had to be toned down a lot, I think, with me personally coming in. I know that was the case, and I still think that's the case. I think that's how people describe me a little bit is you still have the Air Force intensity. I don't think that's ever going to move away from me. Um, I'm just very self-aware of, of what that means. So, yeah, I think that's probably where I've had to adjust the most um, with that. And so long as I can, you know, get to know the people that I work with, I think we kind of get an understanding as to what I'm meaning by it versus maybe the first impressions. Right. I mean, heck, know, Mark, whenever we were talking with you joining the YPO. <laughs> I was just going to say my first interaction with you was extremely intense. But, uh, you know, speaking to YPO, it, it, this was my first interaction with you was when you interviewed me basically to join the forum that, that you're in and I'm in now. But it was also an, a... a good tone to set from my perspective of, wow, these guys really care about who they may or may not let into that group, which also is a cultural thing. There's, you know, culture, it impacts different interactions in our life. And I think that our form has its own culture that we've kind of grown into. And that was really an initial statement to me of how much that group cared about, you know, who they were going to let in. And not that somebody wasn't a good person or whatever, but you just needed the right fit. And it was very clear to me that you cared deeply about that. So, but I was a little bit intimidated. You were, you were, you know, even though you had a great name and spelled it right, I was like, this guy's pretty intense. I mean, he's going to, he's going to hold me to, to, to task, which was great. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, with, with that foundation of culture becomes all the daily operations. <laughs> and one of the big one is trust. And so you bring in people that that is compromised. That's a, that's a recipe for disaster. Absolutely. So 
talking about YPO, what has YPO meant to you? What has it provided you or how has it helped you, you know, get better every day? What, how would you describe YPO in your journey? As we all know, in the YPO side, there's, uh, there's personal, there's family and there's business. Um, you know, I think the, the very big side of, of our forum and what it has done for me has been on the business side. So if I go back to this acquisition that, you know, was two, two and a half years in the making, uh, the people, my YPO forum members, um, if anyone were to go ask them what was the Proteus acquisition like and, and what, what did it mean, every one of them could answer in detail uh, what that acquisition was doing. And that's just because of how much I needed that forum when we were doing deal structures, alignment, um, the pitfalls. You know, I think that's, it's great when we hear about what worked. It's more importantly when people can introduce where they have had pitfalls. And that, that happened quite a bit, um, you know, in our, in our forum. And that's great because then I could bring it back to, okay, better watch out um, whenever we're doing. And, and actually a big part of it was, Mark, make sure you are razor focused on on that uh, cultural integration. Don't bring something that's going to really mess up what you've established uh, within your food technologies group. So I think that from the business side, um, from a personal side, um, you know, we had a we had a challenge with our youngest son um, in December. Uh, he was diagnosed with a pituitary tumor, and it you know it came very shocking to obviously to to any family to Melinda and I. And, you know, I use that, that form as a sounding board. Um, the good thing is, is that, you know, you can, you can speak very openly in that form about how you're feeling. And, uh, you know, our, our form was an extremely sound foundation um, that I could really go through everything that he was going through and the challenges I was going through with it. And a lot of times people just listened. They didn't say anything. They just let me talk about it and then we would move on. And so... Um, you know, those are, I think, the two that I'll introduce. The rest I'll kind of leave off to the side. Right. And I, I think that that's what's important. As, as leaders, you know, there's, there's a saying, it's lonely at the top, but YPO provides that outlet for that. And, you know, if as a leader you're not sound in those three categories that you mentioned, you know, the personal life can totally interfere with the way that we lead and the, the impact that we can make as leaders. So I think having that personal board and, and you know, the, the struggle you just mentioned – it's important to have an outlet for that to the, you know, get yourself right so that when you do show up for each category, you're presenting your best self. Um, and, and that's what I've, I've found that it helps a lot too. And, and you described that really well with some of those examples. Well, listen, thank you so much for being on. Uh, last question. Is there anything that I should have asked that I didn't that you would like, like me to ask you or like to answer? I, I never got you to ask what my favorite color was i that's kind of a <laughs> big one to me and so i wish you know if we could have gone into more personal ones on that no um no i think this is a, a good uh, good podcast good questions that you've been asking awesome well again thank you so much for your time i know that uh, it's precious uh as a leader and uh can't thank you enough and uh we'll talk to you soon yeah.